it basically say seven years insurance costs, taxes, mm-hmm. re- typical repairs. If you do that over seven years, there's no shot. And that's the average time someone stays in a house. Yes. There's no shot you're going to make money on. This is the Real Estate Investing Experience. We get it. Real estate can be rough sometimes. And that's why we bring in the experts to talk about the experiences you won't hear anywhere else. With your hosts, John Cohen and Chris Grinzik. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Real Estate Investing Experience. I'm your host, Chris Grinzik. With me, as always, is John. How are you? I'm doing good. Uh... Hanging in there, yeah. And, but uh, yeah, getting close to the holiday season, so next year world stops, and uh, just ended twenty nineteen strong and hope for a big twenty twenty. Yeah, we'll see. We got a couple yeah, couple so balls up in the air right now. We Let's definitely see if they, do. If they come down gracefully, <laughs> or if they come down crashing. Yeah, that we'll, could happen. We'll figure it out one way or the other. Um, but not going to get too much into it. Um, got a really great guest on today. Uh, another in studio episode. I'm very happy instead of doing yes. it on Zoom. Um, gonna let him introduce himself, but you know, Long Island real estate, where we're from, you know, more on the flipping side of things. Truthfully, I don't even know his whole story. Um, so I'm really interested to learn more and get into stuff, especially with, you know, local real estate, cause we're not really involved in it much. No. So I'm always curious to hear yeah. more about it and, you know, find out more on what he's doing and go from there. But, uh, with that being said, Charles, thanks for coming. Thanks man. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Good to see you again, man. It's been Absolutely. a long time. Yeah. Good to meet you. I see you guys are doing great things. Very cool to be a part of it. Uh, so in the real estate world, for better or for worse, and opinions definitely do vary in this department, I am known as the handsome home buyer, <laughs> aka Captain Permit. Uh, I'm a fix and flip investor on Long Island turned commercial real estate developer. So um, I'm one of the biggest, if not the biggest, fix and flip investor on Long Island, doing anywhere from 70 to 110 houses a year. Now segueing into doing commercial development via a master's degree at NYU that I'm finishing up right now in real estate development. So this is the end of my sixth year in real estate. I was in the body shop business before that. Mm-hmm. Read Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 27, said that's it. If I'm gonna be a professional investor, <laughs> I'm out of here. No more paint fumes for me. And uh, so the journey begins. I've been to a lot of uh, re-events and things where I've, I've met you and yep. uh, it's just the process and it's, it's awesome, man, it's a wild ride. Um, I'm really interested to talk to you guys about the out-of-state stuff because, like you said, like I do a lot of local stuff, even the big development stuff, which if you want, we'll talk about. Yeah. What you're doing is local, so it's cool to kind of see how you guys do things from across the country while being here in New York. Yeah, so we'll definitely get into all that. Can you touch a little bit more on, you know, when you were 27, what, it, you know, you obviously read the book and then, you know, from there, what was the journey like getting to, you know, 70, 100 flips a year? Because obviously... Cool. You didn't just, you know, get there within no. a couple months. What was that journey like? And, you know, so um, I remember Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I was like, that's it. I'm going to be a professional investor. But what does that mean? Because in the book, they talk sure. about stocks and they talk about real estate. Yeah. Now, for me, I um, I started researching stocks, but it just it doesn't work for me. I'm not into the market. Listen, mm-hmm. a lot of people make a lot of money in the stock market. It's just not for me. I need to, like, see it, feel it, be able to touch it. So I took a class at NYU, it was a one day class after the crash on um, REOs. Because at the time, like everybody knows banks are just giving away properties, they're just sure. giving away for free. Right, that's what everybody thinks when they get into it. <laughs> so I went there and the professor was amazing and said, you want to join the local RIAs. So Real Estate Investment Association. I joined the one in Levittown. I met my first mentor, Carl. I, uh, I started training with Call. I trained with Call for two or three years before I ever did a deal. At the time, I owned a body shop called Mako. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, oh, better get Mako in Hempstead. And I did two deals that first year that I had the body shop. And I said, that's it. I'm done. I put the body shop up for sale. This is the end of my sixth year. And then it just went, uh, first year I did uh, 10 houses, sort of got married, and sort of got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> Um, next year I did 11 houses. The third year I did 40 houses, did get divorced, um, 67 houses, 89 houses, keeps going down to commercial development. Awesome. So I'm, I'm curious for you because you probably don't know this, but the way I got into real estate was my mom and my cousin bought a flipping course through fortune builders. Okay. That was my introduction. I knew nothing before that. So I, at the time when I first started the first house I walked in, I thought asbestos was a type of mold. That's how little I knew. So we tried to flip houses for like mm-hmm. six, seven months. Never 
did jack shit. Okay. Nothing. So what was it like for you? You know, did you have like a construction background or anything like that? Because we we really struggled and you know, I on us, you know, uh-huh. we after six, seven months we said, all right, let's change. It's not like we kept trying to okay. make it work and change and adapt. We said let's change because we had met some other people and I think out of state was kind of more popular than okay. probably when you were getting into it and maybe I'm making an assumption, I don't know, but you know, we really struggled to find deals that had, you know, the margins that made sense to us. Yeah. You know, how have you been able to find success where I didn't? In regards to getting deals, in regards to the construction, the process, All of what? It. I mean, I never, so, I mean, I can't really speak to, I didn't even get to that stage. Okay. So obviously finding deals is the big one. Okay. And I think everybody's always concerned about, you know, how do I find the good deals and stuff like that. So, so I guess, I mean, construction is actually very difficult for me. That was the hardest part because I am not handy at all. I can't mm-hmm. hammer a nail. Sure. So I was very lucky. I've had four great mentors in my life. Two of them were real estate mentors. You might, you know, Carl, obviously, right? Yep. And you might know the other one, uh, the late Les Jansen. Yes. Okay. So Carl told, I trained with Carl for two, three years, very like analytical guy. He's an engineer by nature. Like, business plan, action item registry, the whole nine. So I had him. Then I met this gentleman named Les Jansen. So Les was like a used car dealer, fly by the seat of your pants type of dude. Sure. And he did home inspections. So I was searching for a house for a year. Once I trained for two to three years, and this is the thing that like people don't get. They go to take a course, at a uh, three-day course with Fortune Builders or whatever, yeah. and they're like, I'm ready to go flip houses. It's like, bro, I spent two to three years training. Yeah. Then I spent an entire year trying to get my first house before I actually got into it. So Les walks through the house with me, we sit on the front stoop and he's like, listen, this house is gonna sell right about the time your kids go to college. And then he proceeded to tell me why it wouldn't sell. And I'm like, yo, I don't understand construction. I don't know how to do it. He goes, oh, that's your whole problem? I'm like, that's my whole problem. He's like, oh, it's easy. It's $45,000 to do the inside of the house and it's $15,000 to do the outside of the house. Now, those numbers are not entirely accurate, but it gave me enough understanding about construction that I went out and bought my first house that same week. Interesting. Boom. Got the first one, bought it for X. Like I said, I was going to buy it for X, renovate it for Y, sell it for Z, pitch it to investors. Nobody wanted to like kid you nuts. It's never going to happen. <clears throat> you're overpaying. You can't renovate it for this and you're not going to get that. And literally that's exactly what happened. Bought it for that price, renovated it for that price, sold it for that price. And it was like proof of concept there. Yeah. And then it's a process, man. You're like, you're always learning. I quickly learned on the first deal that um, you can't, I can't deal with contractors. They're, they're the hardest part of this deal. Most people think money is the hardest part of real estate. Sure. Money is the easiest part of real estate, in my opinion. Contractors are the hardest part of real estate. Absolutely. So I built my own staff after the second one. And it's just, it's just a process. You learn, you grind, but like, I'm, I'm obsessed with it. Maybe right. like on an unhealthy level. <laughs> I don't know how you guys are. I have an addictive personality, so like either I'm 150% in yeah. or I'm not. Some people might say that's not good. Some people say it's good. Uh, in regards to the deals, you yeah. want to go down that road? Sure. In regards to the deals, it's just, I always tell people, there's no difference between like what we do and selling Coke or Pepsi or whatever. So I've, I've done everything on the side. I've had, I have a podcast. I have a blog. I do a ton of social media stuff. I had ads on um, on the radio. If you have a house that smells like cab pee, I want to buy it with me <laughs> screaming on it. Constant networking. Every weekend going to meet realtors, going to open houses, shaking hands. And then it's just a matter of how you conduct yourself and do business with people. Right. I make sure it's a, it's a pleasurable experience for the realtors. Mm. I make sure I always deliver. If they call me, if they're nice enough to send me something, I call them back. I give them feedback. I'm structured. If you do things like that, you'll get deals. So I think that's, so that's the part that people don't, people want to go to a three day class, Yeah. then they want to go home, they want to press a button and they want deals to come in. And if it doesn't work in that order, they blow their brains out. Or they say, this sucks, this isn't going to fucking work. The problem is, is that, you know, I think you illustrated right, it's two years training, one year looking, and it's, you've got to be different. You've got to try different things, whether it's direct mail, going to every open house, finding a market you like, finding a contractor, finding a, you know a countertop you want to use, you have to go through the motion for so much time. Real estate is not a push a button, get an answer thing. You got to push a lot of buttons and see which one works. But a lot of people want to, you know, go to one open house and give me all your off-market deals because I'm going to close. No agent in their right (laughs) mind. They're going to send you the deal that 47 people passed on 
And then you're going to think, oh, this isn't a good deal, or, oh, well, this is a great deal, nobody knows about it. And I'm not saying it's good or bad, but but you literally just went through, you know, I went to open houses, I did that. But people don't want to hear that. No. People people want the easy way out. Instant like that, That's a commercial. It's the easy button, right? It, it's just Instant gratification. Yeah, and it, that, this is just not the business. And and I think what people wanted to hear when it was, you know, how do you find the deal? I think people wanted to hear, like, I sent out a thousand direct mailers and I got 20 deals. Hell no. Bro, <laughs> you, I'm so happy it wasn't that. Me too. If you want to be in business in anything, you got to be willing to suffer and bleed and sacrifice and deal with constant rejection. Like for me, I'm a little wacky. Like I crave uncomfortable scenarios <laughs> because I know in those moments that like something awesome is going to happen. Like I'm constantly trying to push myself to another level and that's what it takes. Like you got to get to the point where you're like, fuck, like, is this really going to work? And then keep going. Yeah. That's what I, so I, I tell them all the time because they're, they're cold calling our mobile home side and they're yeah. really pushing and I said, the best thing you're going to do is a deal. You cold call a guy in March and we buy it a year from now because you went through every single up and down. If you call a guy and he says yes right away, that deal's going to be shit. Yeah. It's never going to work. But when you find yourself in awkward situations, uncomfortable situations, yeah, yeah. where it's the hardest to ask the guy the question or it's difficult, that deal is going to make money most likely because you're already getting into unch- you know, un- you know, uncharted waters where it's like, this is awkward. I don't know what to do. I don't know the situation. People don't like that. People don't like that feeling, but that's the feeling that you have to have, I think, to, to, to persevere and go forward. And I don't think people want to do that. I know people don't want to do no. that. People don't want to be uncomfortable, bro. No. They want it to be easy. Like, it's not easy. I, dude, I, it's it's crazy that you guys talk about mobile home parks. I've had a thing for mobile home parks since I was like, since I didn't know anything about real estate, so since I was 25 years old. I just had this thing that like, I want to own mobile home, uh, home parks. And now it's amazing because I see it as the last like horizon of uh, truly affordable housing <laughs> yeah. in in an area where like I have I have four asset classes that I really like right now. I like anything affordable. I do a ton of Section 8, CDC, rentals, et cetera. I love that stuff. It's the best um, mobile home park type of stuff. Uh, I love medical. I love anything senior and I love self-storage. I think those are all crushing it right now regardless of where the economy goes and the demand is huge. So it's funny. So we, we have always historically, you know, I started my real estate career. I, the first property I ever bought was a student house my brother went to school in pennsylvania we bought a house because he he lived with he lived in someone else's house as a okay. sophomore and i went there and a lot I, of people I, start like this yeah, it's interesting with he, college like, housing yeah, yeah. yeah and that, my my whole my whole vision of real estate is i'm gonna just buy houses near college and rent them out to kids because kids live in anything very so smart and they don't care and their parents are paying for and, it and exactly so the hook. i go to my brother's house in pennsylvania he rents his house and i go there and he has to walk through it's two girls and him and his friend mm-hmm. They had to, one of the rooms, you had to walk through the girl's room into a crawl space, go upstairs into an attic. I'm like, what are you paying for this? This is insane. So I was, you know, I was working for a couple years at this point. So I said, okay, let's buy one of these things. What did you do before real estate? Uh, Finance. Okay. So I was a stockbroker. Nice. Uh, um, And I was, let's call it successful, right? Relatively successful. I was able to buy not only that house, but then I went out and bought about 150 houses in Pennsylvania, all through tax auction. Okay. So super rough stuff. But then I said, okay, you know, you're buying a house, you're flipping a house, you, maybe you're, you know, this deal's not going to work, whatever. Then we went over to the multifamily side. And for the last, you know, let's call it 2013, 2014, 100% multifamily focused. Nice. Problem is, is that there's no such thing as affordable housing whatsoever in that space anymore. Now, yeah. everything is super expensive. Yeah. Your C-class stuff is ridiculously priced. So about two years ago, my buddy calls me and he goes, we got to go to this mobile home thing. Uh, you know, you have no idea how much money these things make. And yeah. I'm like, I was like, dude. Warren Buffett owns a ton of that stuff forever, bro. Yeah. And so that's what I said. I said, ever. Okay, let's go. Whatever. I, I'm game, right? I for, you know, so I find myself in Austin, Texas, Tor Mobile Home Parks. So I'm like, what the fuck am I? Where'd my life get to? I'm, I'm, I'm walking through this thing. And then after I leave Texas, I come home. I'm like, holy shit. This is the last bit yes. of affordable housing that exists. That's it. So... I fell in love with it, and then for the last two years, you know, it took us a year, you know, a year back in my head against a call and brokers offering nowhere near it, and now we actually have like three or four under contract. We're That's closing great. on one next week. That's great. Bought one Good earlier this year. Awesome. So it was, but it was a process. Is it value added type of scenario or? So we're underwriting for cash flow with value add. So we're okay. underwriting. It's got to make money day one as is. Of course. 
But then, you know, whether it's occupancy, whether it's, mm-hmm. you know, not in submitted water, or whether it's, you know... Uh, yeah, just below market rents. And below whatever. market rent, exactly. Because so, a lot of them are owned by, like, mom and pop type of people, absolutely. which I, in my research I came up with. Yep. So, yeah, you never... It, it's the same thing with houses. So, you know what? You could be getting 600 for a pad site, but they're only charging 450 Boom. Instant and, bump. Exactly. And it's not... And, and unfortunately, these people have nowhere to go. And yes. the, the affordable side is they'd rather pay 600 because it's going to cost them too much to move. Yeah. And realistically, that six hundred is still if they went to buy a house. There's no else to go. If I can have, plus those mobile homes are not really mobile. Like you no. can't move those freaking. No, homes. they're not going. They'll fall apart. So, yes. so it's a suit, it, and that's why we fell in love with it. We're hoping to build a really, you know, in twenty twenty. I hope we do really big things in a mobile home space. For you, man, I hope so. But, it's amazing. Uh, on top of that, depending on what happens later on, I mean, you can look at it as a standalone investment on its own. But then maybe it becomes a development play later on. You never know. It's, depending it's, on the path of progress, what's going on around it, who knows what happens twenty years out of it. And, and that's Texas sort of, is huge. Exactly, and that's sort of what you know. Part of the business plan. It's you know, you find major metros. I'm not saying we're buying them for covered land plays, but you put the debt on it, you own it for 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. Five years, and you say, well, you know what? There's a real opportunity here. Look, there's a Starbucks, there's a Chipotle, whatever. Yeah, you know, we can do something here. So. That those you know that's that's just like the future of it. And I I agree. I think it's a super affordable. It's what's left. It's still cash flows. Um, I love it, and it's exciting. I love it, man. The um, I love like the the lower end price point of of the market. Like the only thing I want to do is you know Section Eight type housing, yeah. affordable type housing. And then I don't know. Do you guys know about like um like tax credit affordable housing tax credit deals? So I had a management company that was extremely big in it. Yeah. Um, she explained it to us. It was very complicated, and it was about three years ago. We never looked at it again, but I, I know enough to be dangerous that if I ever got involved, I'd fuck it up brutally. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I mean, I learned about this recently. Um, the NYU thing was going back from my from my master's and was just the best thing ever because the people that you are around is just like on another level. So I made friends with a guy who that's what he does. I work for a big developer, I get like 20,000 uh, affordable housing units in New York started in Harlem in the 80s getting like free houses basically and um, essentially like on a real high level you get the property if it meets certain criteria with the state they issue you tax credits that you sell at a slight discount in the open market that you use to build Mm -hmm. so you and then you just offer lower rent as a result so essentially you're into these things for little to no money a lot of times yeah, that's what that's what. So she, uh, Tammy Fossum worked for Blue Ridge, who was right. a management company. She went over mm-hmm. to Latin that they all they did was tax credit stuff, and she said that and I was like, you sell them, and but it it, it yeah. seemed really attractive, but awesome. we never we never explored further. You know, the thing is, it's like guys like us. There's so many things you see opportunity. And there's nothing but opportunity. Like people come to me and they're like, oh, bro, there's no opportunity. I'm like, listen, there is opportunity everywhere you turn. Yeah, especially now, like we're in an awesome position. On how old are you guys? I'm 27, about to be 20. 32. 32. So I just turned 40. So the baby boomers, are this, I feel like there's a big gap, right? The baby boomers, like all, especially around here, like all the big developers, they're 65, 70, 75, 80 years old. There's nobody to kind of take that place. Mm-hmm. So, and things are changing so fast because of technology. I just feel like there's opportunity in every industry out there. Yeah. Well, I think it's crazy because I speak to a lot of younger kids now through the social stuff that are always just trying to get involved and it's you know where do i start yeah you've got an endless amount of opportunities you got to figure out what you want to do and back into one that makes sense yeah and it's everybody always comes with the same ones it's wholesaling it's flipping or it's rentals and Uh it's people don't realize that there's 12 different avenues or more within each of those and then there's 40 other different ways to do it so i think there's always going to be opportunities just how creative can you get finding the different structures, deals, incentives is a big one. You know, that's why people are in rental real estate is because they give different incentives for people to own it through taxes. That's why people love it so much and that's why it creates so much wealth. It's the same thing. And I also think like, you know, like you said, like that baby boomer, there is such a void. In the real estate market in general, I don't care what product that is, there is su- it's such an antiquated business. People are still like going to physical closings. And th- there's such an opportunity with technology coming in yep, yep, yep. that when I hear people say, oh, well, you know, I can't figure out a product. I don't know what I want to do. I say, you haven't given it one thought because yeah. there's so you could, you know, and you're doing it in Long Island and you're flipping houses. And I know people complain all the time because they can't find deals. Yep. Um, they still exist. You just got to look a little bit harder to figure out a different way of doing it. Yeah, you figure out a different angle. And here's the thing people always say, like a couple points. A, as far as getting started, just get started. That's what I tell people. It's like, yo, 
just you have a plan, but the plan changes forever and every day. Yeah. So, but the only thing I can guarantee is this. If you get started, you're gonna make mistakes, things are gonna happen, but things are gonna happen in a positive way too. If you don't get started for fear that you don't have the perfect plan, I guarantee you nothing is going to happen. And that's the worst thing. 100%. Yeah, that's the worst thing. And, and that that I, I I tell that's what I say all the time. We had a we had an event we would do every month, and just I tell I say just do it. Fuck yeah. it out. Lose forty grand on a deal. You're gonna learn more from that one mistake than underwriting deals and analyzing different product classes because you're never gonna get it done. You're gonna underwrite things for four years. Yeah. And nothing's gonna happen. I say just get involved in some way. Ask guy to help. See if you can just shadow. Look it over. Buy something. Mess it up. It's not gonna be that bad, but you got to do it. And here's the thing, listen, today with YouTube and all the programs and everything, there's so many opportunities to learn and ways you can learn books, mentoring programs. And listen, some of them are overpriced and a little sketchy. Yeah, but there's a lot of really good people out there. Agree. Yeah. And I think there's more than enough that's free. Yeah. At least get you up to the point where you are able to buy a hundred, two hundred thousand dollar home and try it. Yeah. Because there's only so much at a certain point, you're gonna plateau on what you can learn from somebody else, not by doing Without a doubt. So, you know, whether it's paid or free, paid if you buy a good course, is just gonna get you there quicker. So it's really just an opportunity yes. loss for me. Free, you're gonna have to wade through a lot of shit to get there and pick up the pieces because anything good that's concise and condensed and is gonna take you less time, they're gonna put a price tag on it. So yeah. to get there for free, probably just gonna take you longer but you can do it. But it's probably gonna get you pretty cl damn close to the same point. Eventually you're gonna have to do it and just figure it out and mess things up. Uh, we were saying with the, the guy that was in here before you, Lance, you know, I learned more from the deals we didn't do down in Jacksonville, Florida, because that's kind of my primary area, than the deals we have done. Okay. I mean, way more. The deals we put under contract, walk, found problems, and have not done and lost money and time on, I've learned a thousand times more than the deals we've closed on and have gone, especially the ones that have gone well. There's some that haven't gone according to plan, I've learned from those, but. The ones we've closed on that have been fine and no headaches, I've learned next to nothing from. Yeah. You know, I've learned how to, you know, watch a deal do well. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I mean, that's nice, but it doesn't help you do anything. I kind of have like a hybrid approach. So for me, like, I'm not, uh, you know, I don't, I don't gamble at all. I'm not like a, um, like a risk. People be like, Charlie, you take like crazy risks all the time, but they're, you guys get it. They're like, they're calculated risks. For sure. So for me, I do a lot of due diligence. I get a lot of education, but it only gets to the point, to your point, like you have to grab your balls and jump. Yeah. At one yeah. Point. Like you can't learn everything without being in it. And even with, you know, I've done 300 plus houses in the last five years. I'm learning something new every day. Cause you yeah. know what? The landscape changes every day. You don't know. It's like a minefield. If you think you're going to wake up in the morning and just do anything other than ride this animal, you, you got nothing coming. It's just, this is what it is. Either you like crave that action or it's not for you. Yeah. And that's fine either way. Yeah. Cause it's not, I mean, flipping houses was, it was a thing that, you know, I read a book, I was like, oh, I'm going to do this. And I, I flipped a house in 2013 in Bethpage and it was, it was phenomenal. Nice. It, was, it was great. But then I took that concept and I was offering and offering. I'm like, why am I not buying anything? And that's around the time of just like all these shows started coming out. And, yeah, man. And it was, I was like, I'm being outbid by 50, a hundred thousand dollars, 200,000 houses. I'm like, there's no way these guys are going to make money, but they all did because 2013 to today is like, you really hard to mess them up. But it, it, well, that's why when, when that shift was, I, I got to focus on, oh. on, on multifamily because I'm being, I'm not competitive whatsoever, but every single deal we looked at, even on the multifamily side and the single family side, it's even more so unless you have a market, you know, I'm going to buy a Levitt house and do the same thing every single time. I got to buy it for X, but every deal has got to have its own challenges and people yeah. don't, you know, people want, I, they want it to be so structured and regimented, and, and that's just not the real estate world. You can put the best system in place, but you know, you buy a house in you know North Hempstead, and you have a permit, but you're in this town, this city, and that in in this town, shit goes completely sideways a yeah. lot. No, without a doubt. I mean, to your point before, you know, there's a ton of shows. Everyone's decided. Like my mentors who've been doing this, like Carl's been doing this for 40 years. He's mm -hmm. like, I've never seen it like this ever. And then on top of that, you have all these institutional private money lenders that are coming in. And they're lending 90% of the purchase price and 100% of the rent home, giving you a $10,000 draw at the closing. So you get two guys who watched uh, you know, yeah, a TV house. show. They each have 10,000 bucks. They go to buy a house in Central Iceland. They pay you know, 250 for it. They should have paid 150 for it. They have no idea what they're doing. It's a bloodbath. And uh, I've heard, I've spoken to a lot of the guys that have uh, those funds. And they say the default rates are like going through the roof now. They gotta be crazy. And it's like, what do you expect? You're lending to people who have absolutely no experience, have no idea what's going on. Yep. Is there 
like like Long Island's huge, yeah. right? So you got you have your central islips, you have your you know your your high end, your low end, your north shore, your south shore. It what? Where's your sweet spot? Because doing 110 houses, it can't be in Hempstead or Garden it's, City. It's, it's got to be it's all everywhere. over. It's everywhere. That's the thing. And I quickly learned that. I'm like, you know what? I need to. Most of the guys I saw were limiting themselves to a certain a radius. They didn't have access. Information is vital. So my girlfriend at the time, she became a realtor. We were working together. So I had access to the MLS, which is vital. People come up to me and they're like, how do you know what the house was going to sell for? I'm like, how the hell would you buy a house that you didn't know what was going to sell for when you were done? <laughs> I was like, oh, I asked the realtor. And the realtor said four to four fifty. First of all, you That's can't have a $50,000 range. <laughs> on, on, on a $400,000 house. On a, on a $2 million house. I, different I, I, can, I can be playing the exactly. $50,000. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm like, you know what? I never ask a realtor their opinion. And not out of like lack of respect for realtors, but... If I'm putting up the money and I'm the professional and I'm the investor, it's my responsibility to know. Yeah. Right? You can ask property management companies and realtors to say, listen, what's the rent in this area? But at the end of the day, you guys know that in Jacksonville, Florida, for a one bedroom, you're going to get X. Yeah. Right? Providing it's an A class, B class, C class, whatever yeah. it is. Ultimate responsibility. That's the thing. Exactly. Yeah. You, you, should, should, you should see the battle they get into with their management about what's the better comps and the rents and all that stuff. I mean, we don't just ask them for what the rents are and take their word for it, where you always do our own thing and then come together and have a conversation about it. And then it's continuing to, you know, check the market and see what it is and make different game plans. So we're, you know, as much as I trust them and I value their opinion, we're always doing our own. Of course, you gotta go to bed at night. You, you, you know, they're they're not going to bed with the risk. And they're, you know, they can get fired very easily. And it, it happens, you know, you ask a real estate agent, oh, it's four, 450. Well, if it sells for three twenty five, she ain't gonna give you the money, <laughs> with, without a doubt. And listen, and and with all due respect to anybody, management companies, um, realtors, whatever, if if they were like if they wanted to do this, they would be doing it. Like if they had if their expertise on pricing and whatnot was so sharp, they would be doing this kind of stuff. Exactly, and and some of them are, some of them aren't. But yes. the the ones that aren't, you know, you got to take their opinion with a grain of salt because, like you said, you have to go to bed knowing that. It's going to sell at X and, yeah. and work off of that number. But that and that. All right. Regardless of their experience and how good they are and if they're doing it or not, it's your decision and your responsibility. Correct. Because people get also like, oh, the people call me like, oh, the realtor screwed me. No, they didn't screw you, man. Like, <laughs> you, didn't do enough. you need to you know. Crazy. Yeah, you need to know. I, in regards to where we do deals, um, I quickly learned that I had to be able to analyze all of Long Island. Because if I wanted to do a big volume, I couldn't just do it in Levittown or Merrick or Belmore or whatever. It had to be everywhere. Yep. How do you manage that process? Because I know when I started and I was looking at Long Island, I said, no, you know, they're like, oh, pick a zip, like, because the reason why people have this, you know, pick a zip code and, and master it, it's like, okay, yeah. that's fine. But, you know, when someone watches Flip This House and they're doing kitchens or bathrooms for, you know, a thousand dollars, and then a guy underwrites a deal in Garden City for a thousand dollar bedroom and he wonders why it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. When you go widespread to do volume, okay, how do you know or what systems that do you have in place or, or what do you rely on to see the difference between Belmore and Merrick? How do you know so much with, you know, how many people work for you? What's that system look like? Before you answer that, just for people yeah. who aren't from Long Island, can you just give a reference to how big of an area do you actually cover in miles or distance traveled or something like that? Uh, how Roughly. About, so basically from the Queens border, which is Elmont, like Elmont, yeah. all the way out to I've done deals in Quagga and the Hamptons. It's going to be what? 50, no, it's probably, probably like 90 miles. I was just about 100 miles. Yeah. Probably, give or take. So I think Long Island, it's like 120 miles. Yeah, it's 120 together. miles from like Nassau, the first in Nassau is a mom talk. So yeah. take out, so you know, yes. take out 10 or 20. Exactly. <laughs> At this point, the system that we have, like, I don't even see the houses. I go to see them once to buy them. I always want to put my eyes on them, and then I basically never see them again. Mm -hmm. So you're asking me, how do I manage the process of acquiring, renovating? What specifically? Yeah, I would say. I think that the biggest question people have is, you know, you know, what do you do? You see the house. Yeah. How do you know I'm going to put 50000 into it or mm -hmm. I'm going to put 20000 or I'm going to put 200000 into it? Or or is there a, I never buy a house over 600000 Is there any criteria or you're pretty much willing to do anything if it makes amount, if it makes the right amount of money? So it really depends on the market. Like originally I started out in first time home buyer market. Um, so in Nassau, that's houses for sell that sell for under five fifty today. In Suffolk, it's under four fifty. Mm -hmm. Right. I started doing a little bit more expensive houses. I don't like the high end luxury stuff. I never did in any capacity. 
now the market is such where the only things that are really moving are those first time home buyer houses yep, yep. and people are very sensitive to taxes because of the way things are, are sure. changing, which makes the competition even tougher because now you have this compressed market. Well, I'll tell you, that's why I don't own a house. I haven't looked to buy one because I don't the, either, and I don't the really mortgage want and tax write off. I own one, I fucking hate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, when it was capped, I was like, well, now there's really no point. I was still, even with the, the, the you know, before the tax change where you could write off the interest mm-hmm. and the taxes, total amount, I still didn't want to do it. But once they changed that to 10000 I was like, it doesn't make sense. Your taxes are $10,000. I don't really ever have a desire to own a house, which is crap. Like I tell people all the time, like, listen, I, I flip a ton of houses. I have no desire to own my own house. Oh yeah, it's brutal. For a I'm, number of different reasons. I'm in multifamily real estate. I truly believe in that. But I mean, I have, I love my wife, love my daughter. But when we were, when she was, when she was pregnant or getting pregnant, she, you know, I want, you know, I want, I don't want to be in an apartment or well, I said, oh, yeah, we could rent, but we bought a house. I luckily I'm very stubborn. So I think I got a good deal. And I, yeah, I got got definitely got your thing. Mm-hmm. So I have value there, but mm-hmm. it's good fake enough. Value. He debated about selling it and angering his wife. Yeah, my wife. My he wife. Did, he did okay. We bought the house in July in Mineola. Okay. Um, for four twenty. Nice. Really nice. Um, yeah, and then halfway through the process, my wife she was doing February. So we're like almost done, and I'm like, hmm, well, you know, I probably yeah, like, don't even fucking think about it. And now I now I want to fucking rip the top off and dormer it, and I'm like, oh, if I have a house, might as well go all in, right? Fuck it. But no, I I I say it all the time. My brother, I was like, don't buy a house, you crazy? That's something. Don't don't. It's it's so stupid. Thirty year yeah. mortgage. It's it's. I, I cannot be a bigger advocate against not buying a house. Yeah. yeah. It, I guess you know it, it all depends. We say that, but that's not the general public. Like for the general. I, I have this experiment I want to do, and I had this kind of argument with my dad about it, and because and he owns a house, obviously, they grew up in. I'm like, listen, I want to track 30 years of ownership of a house. And when you're talking about refinance costs, taxes, all that stuff, did you really make any money at the end of the year? It's quit Like, like a Millionaire. Money. Yeah. It's a, it's a good book. It's called Quit Like a Millionaire. Okay. They basically say seven years insurance costs, taxes, mm-hmm. re- typical repairs. If you do that over seven years, there's no shot. And that's the average time someone stays in a house. Yes. There's no shot you're going to make money on. It, the, the interest cost yes. on the mortgage alone for seven years is going to sink you. You know, your average taxes, you know, yes. $12,000 average taxes for seven years, hundred grand, boom. Yep. Maintenance, you put a pool in, you renovate, you refi three times. But for the general public, again, you guys are very fortunate. Like you have a lot of knowledge. You're like in the top 0.1% of like people who understand multi real estate. The average person we weren't even taught how to how to balance a checkbook in high school. That's yep. a huge problem. So it's it's forced savings for the general public, That's what I was which say. is very important. Correct. It's very important. Mm-hmm. I just think um, I think really the biggest problem is people are just and I see it all the time. Like I'm selling these houses to people. I'm like people are just living far beyond their means. That's like the biggest problem. Yes. So we got into that again in the last. Probably should have just done the two of you together. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we we were just talking about. It. That's something I learned in the last, I was, I'm going to repeat it. So if you listen to the last one, you can skip ahead about a minute, <laughs> but I've learned in the last 12 months, a lot of my friends that make similar amounts to me uh-huh. don't have nearly as much or nothing invested or saved up yep. because instead of living a $40,000 lifestyle by making 80, 90, hundred, whatever yep. it is, they live that $120,000 yeah. lifestyle <laughs> making 80. Exactly. And they, they don't understand that saving and me and Linus were going back and forth, I still think saving is almost the entire battle. Because once yeah. you save, as long as you put it in something, as long as it's not the bank today, as long as it's something other than a bank today, you're probably gonna do okay over the long term, which is why people that are forced to save when they buy a house yeah. do okay over 30 years because you're forced saving. So the fact that you know people live and don't save, I think is the reason that most people aren't able to retire comfortably when they're 50, 60, 70 years old. And this is a battle I had with my brother all the time because we're, we're basically polar opposites. And he mm-hmm. just, a month ago, he's like on the real estate way. He's coming to the office every day now, nice. which is fucking awesome. That's cool. I finally got him there. It took, you know, he's 30, I'm 32. So it took us a little while. But, mm-hmm. I, you know, even when we were really young, I was I was different from a standpoint. I said, like, I want to work my fucking ass off till I'm 35 and stop working. Yeah, but you won't because you love it too much. So that's what everyone else does. They're like, yeah, no shot. Yeah, I don't think that happens for anybody. I don't think anybody does that. I say the same thing. I'm like, my goal is marriage, retirement, and kids all of 40 to like a hot 28-year-old. And I was like, now I'm like, I'm never retired. I love this. It's, it's, not, it's, it's a job, but I really do love everything about this. So 
it's different. And my brother was like, fuck that. I want to party like a rock star until I'm 60. I'll figure it out after. I'm like, okay. I, I would love that too. It sounds like a great idea, but I'd rather work less. So the one thing that I always did, even when I, because I, I was on the phone today screaming at somebody and I said, you know, I've never had a job that I got a paycheck. Every job I've ever had is commission based. Yeah. So anytime I got a check, 50 bucks, 100 bucks, you know, $5,000, I always said, okay, 50% for taxes, which yeah. is not, that's that's not the income bracket that you, you start out at. So yeah. I said, okay, got a $5,000 commission check, 50, 2,500 bucks away. I only have 2,500 to play with. And then mm-hmm. you pay your taxes. And at the end of the day, it's like, oh, wow, look at all this money that I can play with. And that's, I always did that. And that, that savings, I know the general public does affect. I think schools do a fucking shitty job really educating Marvel. people on you know, what to invest in anything. I, and I'm not, a, I'm not a school guy. I played baseball in college. I fucking hated every single bit about high school. Yep. It was like, okay, you go to, to kindergarten, to third grade, then you do it again with a little bit more. Then you do it again with a little bit more. Then you go to college and they make you take classes that are completely ridiculous. I, it was, I was in Queens College. I transferred to Queens College and I was on the baseball team. And if you played a sport, you didn't have to take a gym class. You didn't have to take like a gym credit. Yeah. So I said, but for whatever reason, I had an economics degree. They're like, oh, you have to take it. It's a requirement, even if you play a sport. I was like, okay, fine. I'll take skiing because I raced for Okemo. Skiing is a class? Yeah. I raced for <laughs> Okemo when I was younger. Are you uh, school? I went to uh, Queens College. So what? Did, how did you have that class? It was just, it, so they basically, you go there mm-hmm. and you sit there and it was once a week or no, once every other week. And then the final was you went on a ski trip. Oh Jesus! So what would you do in class? I feel like they just try to get thing. I feel like, they're like this is the gloves was you there wear. A simulator or something. Like, <laughs> so you did nothing. So I sat there. I said they just try to get money at you. That, at that point. That's, that's a bunch it. of bullshit. That was it. And I said I was like that's guys. Scary. So I said at the end of the day we had a final and the the class trip was a bowling else. class. I remember this. My wife did yeah. bowling. Bowl, my wife did bowling in Nassau. Yes, <laughs> and golf. My bowling and golf. I, did oh, a, I had a ceramics class. Yeah, I so did So I had an art class. I didn't do any of my work. I had a very good friend of mine do my projects. At the yeah. end of the class, the professor said, what's your major? I said, economics. He said, bullshit, you have to be an art major. Your, your work is so good. I was like, <laughs> I was like I'm not doing any of this shit. Like, it's not me, but but that's college. Yeah. yeah. If they taught you like a great book, another one is called Profit First. Mm-hmm. It's a book that doesn't, it's for businesses about actually paying yourself. And yeah. if you make 100%, only use 70 and keep 30 for yeah. yourself. But it, it goes into that, you know, if people knew how to do that, you know, maybe they're not buying houses. Maybe mm-hmm. they are buying a multifamily. Maybe they're doing something different. But no one teaches you that. You go through, you know, 20 years of education. Yeah, that's shit. And yeah. it's, it's you're yeah. throwing money in the garbage when, yeah. you know, you know I, my brother's partner, before he sold his butcher shop, his father bought him a butcher shop. Wait, so was it Center Cops? Yes, it was. And how they, he's the man, that kid. Justin? Yeah, yeah, Justin's a good dude. So I Justin, my yeah, Justin, wow, that, that's random. Yeah, my brother, that was my brother's old partner. That is random. So he sold his butcher shop. Yeah. But Justin's dad said, I'd rather buy my kid a business and he fucks the whole thing up. Wow. It's better than going to college because college is going to cost me $200,000. Wow. Or I can buy him a business and he's going to get life experience. He's done very well. Yeah. He's done very wow. well. That's crazy. Yeah. Such a small world, man. It, it really is. And that, people don't understand that. It's like, go yeah. take a gamble on yourself and learn and, and, and save a little bit more and do something different because that's yeah. so that's my sister's a complete opposite side of the coin so my sister lives in orlando works for disney okay in finance so has some sort of a background i love her but i'm gonna talk a little bit <laughs> she she bought a town home okay. about two years ago and she actually just sold it and bought or is in the process of buying a new place and somehow something happened with the taxes where she overpaid or they're over escrow she, she got a check back for like two grand or 2,500 bucks or something like that. And she called me, she's like, what should I do with it? I was like, what do you mean? She's like, well, I have 2,500 bucks. What should I do with it? I was like, okay, why don't you just, you know, know, put it in the stock market or something. She's like, I don't want to do that. Why don't you buy Disney stock? You work there. She's like, no, 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 I don't know. I was like, why don't you just buy an ETF? Or like, I put out like 20 different things, all liquid and, you know, all this stuff. And then she kept saying, no, 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 no. And I was like, why don't you pay down your mortgage? She's like, okay, I'll do that. And it was like the only thing she felt comfortable doing with because even though she has a finance background and she has yeah. college education and she grew up around my parents who have that save. So my parents were the prototypical, you know, millionaire, saved up money, lived well below their means and just invested in the right things and, you know, did all that. And now they're both retired, you know, younger than most people in the country. So even with that example, you know, still for whatever reason, wasn't comfortable 
Do nobody it. teaches you how to do this stuff. No, no it doesn't exist. It doesn't. And Unless you seek hard. it out. I think the problem is too many people are focused on the short term. So if they buy well, that Disney stock and it goes down 10%, they're, they're afraid. Yeah, they're, that, pull, they're that pulling they're, the ripcord. Yeah, where it's, if you, so perfect, not to get into stocks and stuff too much, but I've owned Tesla for about two years. Okay. And I was just down massive. And all of a sudden it just shot back up because they just changed the, the like uh, incentives for all the electric green vehicles and stuff yeah. like that. And if I had been afraid and didn't understand the context of how stuff works over the long term, I would have sold it and lost a ton of money. But now I'm back up like fucking 30%, which yeah. is great for me. But it's, I think people are afraid and don't understand how it works in the short term I don't know versus if, the long term. I don't think they're afraid. I think that they're, that they're lazy. It goes back to your point before about instant gratification. You have to understand that the process to be successful is the same in anything regardless of what you do. And you have to go through this process. And the process takes time and involves work and education. And mm-hmm. people just, they just want sure. you done, bro. Yeah. But, want you so, done. so I went to, a buddy of mine got two tickets to a real estate event in Long Island. And I'm, I, I don't want to call it out because I thought it was almost criminal. They had an event where halfway through the pitch, I went there with experience. I was like, I'm going to go here because there's people that are going to pay for this stuff. There's investors here. Let's bump into some people. So halfway through this event, they, you know, they do the normal stuff. Hey, come to the back now. Instead of paying 15,000, we'll give it to you for 10 if you yeah. swipe your credit card. So there were like 350 people there. Like 200 people get up and sprint to the back of the room. I'm like, yeah. oh, okay, this is crazy. Yeah. Now, accidentally, they had a slide that they showed and they were running the same event in three other states and they were like, oh, like delete it. Then... After the real estate presentation, a guy gets up there and literally starts pitching the average Joe day trading with options. Whoa. Yeah. And I sat there. I'm like, oh, my God. They're selling programs for like 2500 bucks to like how to day trade options. I'm like, you know what can go wrong by day trading options? But it touches on the instant gratification. He's like, yeah. if you buy one stock of Disney at 20 bucks and it goes up to 25 you make 25%. But if you buy 70,000 option contracts <laughs> for the same price and it goes up $1, and I was like, I said, as, a, as a financial, I was, as a financial <laughs> advisor, prior to what a Series 7 and Series 63, I look at that and I'm like, there's something so illegal and wrong about this. They're selling programs for these people and I'm just, but that's, but that's in yeah. like The guy's like, well, you know, if you do the same transaction, spend the same amount, it goes up a dollar, you make 70 million bucks. And I'm like, yeah. But if it goes down, you are mortgaging your life. <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, I think a, a thing that people also need to realize, and I've been fortunate enough, my, my father was in business. So that's that's all I know. I've been comfortable in business because I've seen him. I've seen his successes, his failures, like anything, over an extended period of time. He's 67 years old. People live every day like, if, it's, if business is good, they live every day like business is always going to be <laughs> like that. And that's the thing people have to understand. It's not always like that. It's up it's down. And things are also changing so fast in this modern world that what I tell people is this. As soon as I started flipping a ton of houses, like I was buying 40 houses, 67 houses a year, I was like, okay, this is awesome. I got to maximize it, but I got to find the next thing because I know that this is going to be over at some point in the not so distant future. So I went back to school and to take that level. But that's the thing. Like as soon as you find something that you're successful at, that you're going to make money in, you better start looking for the next avenue within it or, and branch off because technology, things are going in and out. I mean, who would have thought that Blockbuster would have went out of business? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Who would have thought that you know MySpace was the biggest thing and it's gone? Like you see everything out, Sears. Everything was a life expectancy. The early 1900s. Period. Yeah. It's, 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 retail. It's, Whoever thought retail would be. You no, know, it's crazy. Before Amazon became this, you know, beast of a product. Like I, the, the story I tell to define, I'm you know, if you know, when everyone likes South Park, mm-hmm. I hated it. Whenever if everybody's going this way, I'm going that way my whole life. Without I'm a doubt. stubborn son of a bitch. So. I, people are buying stuff on Amazon. Everyone's got Prime members. I have Prime membership. I don't want anything from Amazon. Mm-hmm. So I went to Dick's to get sneakers. Dick's Sporting Goods. Do you like to go, I like to go to the store. I still do. Maybe. I went I to... I went, so, so, yeah, because it's tough. So I went there. Mm-hmm. And I get a pair of shoes and I said, can I get this in a 12? Kid takes his phone out, scans and goes, they'll be right out. I was like, okay. I'm standing there. Five minutes, ten minutes. I'm over there. I'm like, what the fuck? Where are these shoes? I go to the guy. I'm like, where are my shoes? He's like, no, they're coming right out. 20 minutes. I said, I'm a fucking idiot. I leave the store. Mm-hmm. I go take a picture of three pairs of sneakers on my phone. I leave the store. I go online. I order four sneakers in sizes. Mm-hmm. They come. I put them on. I'm like, all right, I like these. I put the ones. I ship them home. I'm like, mm-hmm. now I know why no one goes to the fucking store because the people that work there don't give a shit. Yeah. And there's no reason to. But 
I still like to. I like to go least, there. I, I like to go like the other day I, I was in uh I had a, I, I was in Israel on Tuesday for a day for an investor meeting, which is another I mean, it's completely You went to Israel for a day? Twelve yeah. hours. Twelve I mean that's awesome. <laughs> but like Jesus. Flew out on Monday at four, got there at nine thirty in the morning, left on an Did you get the money? Like, we did. We uh, got okay. the money, confirmed everything. It was cool. a phenomenal trip. Now we have bank issues, so we'll, we'll figure that out. But I did that. So on Sunday, I said, I got to go buy. I want to go buy a new sports jacket and stuff. And, and like I said, I, I went online. I'm like, yeah, it's never going to get here in time. I went to the store and I went to a store. I was like, wow, there's some really cool shit here. I ended up spending more money than one. I bought a pair of shoes and a belt. And, but it was like that. Like that was still good to go there. But but Amazon, like people don't want to do that anymore. It's Christmas time. I went to Russo Field Mall. Which is a major mall in Long Island. It's empty. It was on there. Yeah, yeah, man. It was shocking. I'm like, why is this not busy? It's two weeks before Christmas. Everything has a life exactly, period. One day, Amazon will be out of business. Yeah, some, something will take it something over will take it over. That's what it is. And, uh, and the CEO says it. He says, all I'm doing is trying to extend our life expectancy because one day we're going to be extinct. Yeah. And that's with everything. And people, like, they get, they get a certain type of job or a certain type of business and they just feel like the gravy train's never going to stop. And it always stops. You always have to be looking. You can't be comfortable. You have to be comfortable in the uncomfortable, yep. basically. And I'm sure, you know, going from 10 houses to 100 houses, mm -hmm. at some point you knew or you've seen it. And that's probably why you're now doing commercial development or yep. attracted by it. Or it, it was a part of the decision that this housing world, you know, it may go on for another 10, 20 years. But at some point, something's going to shift it. I gotta, I'm going to do more, do something else or do more in addition to this. Yeah, I mean, when I first got into the game, I, I wanted to have a read. So then I started, I'm like, how do I make people? I have to prove to people that I can make them money. I started flipping. How am I going to make money now? Exactly. I started doing it that way. But as soon as I started flipping, I was like, you know what? This isn't going to last forever. So I just started buying a ton of like one and two family properties on Long Island. So I rented them in Section 8 because I'm like, you know what? If this whole thing dries up tomorrow and I can't flip houses, because at the end of the day, flipping houses is just a potentially high paying job. Yeah. You're not building generational wealth. Correct. What you guys do or buying rental properties, that's what changes your kids, 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 kids' lives. Exactly. So I started buying all that stuff saying, you know what, if this ends tomorrow, I can, I'm not going to starve because I have all these rentals, these government rentals. At the same time, I'm like, all right, great. Now I have that going. Now it's time to shift, learn about commercial. For me, it's more of like, I need to be stimulated all the time. I have an addictive personality. I always need to be pushing it to the next level. So, and for me, that's why I want to do the private equity fund because that's like the pinnacle of investing in my mind. I agree. I agree 100%. I think that, you know, my goal getting into this was not what I'm doing. It was, uh, the original goal was I wanted to buy industrial warehouse and convert them into condo developments. And th that was a sexy, attractive thing. Uh, the boss of my boss, Marcus Millichap, convinced me not to. Mm -hmm. You know, the goal is to have, you know, my, my original, it's, it's to raise money to go buy real estate. Yeah. Multifamily, single family flips, notes, whatever it is, yeah. that was the goal behind it. I think that's still the ultimate goal we're working towards, whether it's a private equity fund or, or something, but that's, to me, attractive because you could sit back and now you're, you get to pick what you want to do. And, and that, I mean, I, I love that. I think it's awesome. And it's not, whether it's multifamily, mobile home parks, flipping, whatever it is, I, you know, having a little bit of knowledge in all of it is, is exciting. Yeah. What, what was the transition like from the flipping world into, you know, some of the other asset class? I know you named a bunch. I don't know what you're actually in or doing. Mm -hmm. How was the transition from, okay, flipping houses is one thing, but now building however many units is probably very different. Going to self storage is probably very different. Medical is probably totally another world. What was that process like for you? What did you do? How much did the, the master's degree play in that? So I really, I love the process. That for me is like, sure. is the whole thing. you have to. And exactly. And for me, it's like, is I learn a little bit, like get into something, it starts working. Okay, great. Now I have kind of like this side thing where I'm learning. The master's degree at NYU was like, I would recommend that program to anybody. Man. Mm -hmm. That thing is a complete and total game changer. I would not be doing what I'm doing now without it. You are surrounded by the best of the best professors who are the top of what they do in whatever it is that they're good at, whether that be you know law, I mean, hedge fund owners, giant developers. I mean, I'm sitting next to Silverstein's grandson who owns the World Trade Center, for those people out there that don't know that. Like, billionaire Chinese investors' sons. Like, the network of people that you're around and the amount of money and the level that they're on is, is, is nothing like you've ever seen. So now when I get into these deals, I call these guys. And they're great and they're helpful and I've made friends and we're doing deals together and it's just an unbelievable uh, resource. 
You can't beat it. That's huge. I, I know I looked at, in 2015, 16, I looked at the, and I said, you know, Masters in real estate probably doesn't hurt for me. Go, bro, go. So, and I, I, I'm i I'm, uh, so adverse to anything school, but I figured. <laughs> it's not, the, listen, I was getting thrown out of class. I barely graduated school. I got suspended for giving teachers the finger. I was a disaster. <laughs> I have ADHD the max. They tried to put me on Ritalin when I was a kid. I took it once, turned to a zombie, and I used to throw it down the drain. <laughs> I could not sit still. I had one teacher that understood me. She used to open up the door in second grade and say, run around the building until you burn it off and come back. Because I had so much energy. I hated school. But this is not the same. So that's thing. I, I felt that way. And I never, I looked at it online and said, I, uh, let's let's postpone this to, to for the right time. So are, are we putting us on hold to go enroll right now? Yes, we're enrolling yeah. masters. It will change your life, bro. So, and it's also something I am so passionate about real estate. I can talk about real estate hours on hours. My wife's like, when I go home, she's like, what the fuck? Like, she yeah. hates it. Like, she yes. literally hates real estate with yes. passion. Um, <laughs> yes. And it, when I go home, I'm talking to you, like, you do you talk about anything other than this? I was like, oh, I love the Yankees. Like, <laughs> I can talk about that, but. <laughs> it's, it's, listen, I Everything get it. a wife wants to hear. Exactly. I get it. I, I, I do. I do. But one of those type of programs, it will it will take you to the next level. Because it, there, there are so many things in that space that I don't know anything about and I would love to learn. And like I said, like, so my, my very good friend works for Silverstein and I just see what, like, nice. Things that he's doing, and I'm like, geez, he was in, you know, thirty under thirty when he was, you yeah. know, now he's thirty two. But like before you. that, it just it's such an intriguing space, and just having that extensive knowledge can't hurt. It, it, it can't, and the, the network of people sitting there, like you said, right. that's how I look. I look at everything like that, though. I mean, even it's like, you know, this podcast is partly that. Like, you know, we're gonna have guests on, you know, every Tuesday, Thursday for however long. It's like at least there's more people. I put a contact in my phone, and I can yeah. pick up the phone and call. And, right. and, and that's what's going to make you successful or not. It's Without not going to be, you know, oh, I found this really good deal that I can flip or buy or multifamily. It's, you know, wait a second. I have a really interesting thing. Oh, let me pick up the phone and call Charles because he might have went through this and there there could be something there and he could maybe educate me a little bit more or Without maybe there's there synergies there. And that to me is about success, not, you know, oh, I made a million dollars on this deal. That's great. But having the people on your phone that you could, you know, network with and build relationships with and do deals with that's the stuff that that gets me excited. Well, that's that's literally what don was talking about today when you guys got on the phone with what's his name at the bank he said that's the people you need who you pick them up they know exactly who to call who's going to be able to get exactly yep. what you need done and they're going to be able to handle the problem for you instead of going through the four or five levels going up to him where we're just beating our head against the wall and getting nothing accomplished you have a five minute conversation with him. he's like oh yeah sure shoot me the info and i'll get it done whether he gets it done or not is hearsay, and we'll see what happens. But so I keep checking my phone. <laughs> it's relatively important yeah, at this but point. It's, <laughs> it's it's just the the difference in what you're talking about, and I think that's you know a massive part of it. But um, have you have you actually started doing some of the other asset classes and yep. stuff like that? What have you? These are all in the development process, so or the approval process, because the look, permits on Long Island, as yeah. you guys know, it's like it's it's years. So. Um, in regards to asset classes, my, my thing is, I just want to touch on this before I go into that. I always wanted to understand a little bit about everything. I don't have to know all about it. I need to know people that really know, but I need to understand a little bit about all of it because when I go out and I look at a piece of property and someone wants a certain number or they're stubborn or whatever, if I'm only a multifamily developer, if the numbers don't work, it's not going to work for me. But if I can do self-storage or medical or this or that, and the price points work differently, I can acquire something and I can put my investors money to work where other guys can't. Mm -hmm. And most people I know only do one type of thing. Yeah. So for example, like if the multifamily market, the cap rates get compressed to nothing, everyone's chasing it, you're like kind of out of business yeah. to a certain extent. Yeah. But now you branch in the trail parks, you know, do self storage or this or that, you put money to work and, and you can still make money. So you always have to, you know, have different avenues. Sure. Um, some of the stuff I'm doing now, so, um, I'm purchasing uh, two and a half acres of four acres of the Oceanside Jewish Center, which is a temple in Oceanside. So they had a congregation that used to be a thousand, now they're down to 500. So I am basically rezoning the property and we're gonna be building an assisted living facility there. But I did it in a very cool way, at least I thought. Some people really appreciated it, some people wanted to stab me and drag me from the back of their car, where I very publicly on YouTube went out and then I had, um, I held meetings in Oceanside. I said, listen, I'm gonna give you guys five economically viable options that there's a huge need for, and I wanna hear the feedback, and I want you guys to decide what goes on in, in your town, because ultimately, like, this is where you come from, this is where you grow up with. I'm your neighbor, but I want you to be happy. I'm 40 years old, 39 years old. I wanna be doing this for the next 50 years. Yeah. 
it was a very cool experience. And through that, I learned a lot. Some people hated me. Some guy got drunk, charged up the aisle, tried to grab me. <laughs> it was it was interesting. But now we're in the mix of doing that. I just got an um, accepted offer. I mean, signed contracts after nine months on a property in Farmingdale Village, which I think is perfect for self storage. I'm gonna go sit down, have a conversation with the mayor, go over that, see if that's something he's interested in. I have a couple of different options there. I um, I bought a piece of property that used to be an old gas station. We're closing in January. Uh, we have to remediate it. It's toxic. I was going to build a medical office there. Now um, 7-Eleven has interest and they might end up doing a ground lease over there. So we're in the mix of, of all these things. Yeah. I know a little bit about it. I know enough to be able to jump on, check out some comps, feel my way through it. But at this point, like I get these gut feelings mm -hmm. about things. I'm sure you guys too, just from having the experience. I, I say that. I say it all the time. You know, real estate makes sense on paper. It might not. But it can make the most sense on paper if you go there and see it, and you don't get that feeling. I say don't do it because no matter how much it makes sense, you got to you got to feel if it's for you or not. And I don't think people give any credit to that whatsoever because everyone's like, oh, put an eight cap on it and it makes sense. It's like yeah, maybe, but if you don't get excited or feel something, then I I I, yeah. I, don't, I bail. I mean, interesting story about the the self storage thing. So I um, I got this deal uh, through an agent. And it was uh, it was zoned for like 18 units, and the guy wanted two and a half times what it was worth to build just regular like multifamily housing. So at first I like turned it down. Then I thought about it, and to your point about knowing people, I looked online. I saw that a self storage dealer closed. I called the broker up, started talking to him, picking his brain. He was really he was nice. Told me a lot of different things. Because of that, I got to be able to go back to him, overpay him for his property because the self storage numbers work. Regardless, the economics there work. So having that knowledge, even a little bit of different asset classes, allows you to get into deals even with totally unrealistic people who want money that, that doesn't make sense. Exactly, because it, it might not make, they may look at it and everyone's gonna look at it that way, but if you have a different perspective, you can say, yeah, you know what? I can give you a million bucks that's worth 500 because I'm gonna put something up that's gonna cost less and it's gonna make twice as much money. Exactly. And nobody's looking at it that way. Yeah, and exactly. I think too, having the knowledge and the people and other experiences, you know, even if you know you could have built 18 multifamily units by yourself, but it was overpriced, but you'd rather have 50% of a self storage facility with a partner and deal you weren't going to do. So if you have somebody that has the experience and you can partner with them and bring them in, that's way more valuable than just not doing the deal. So having more of those contacts to your point, you know, with school and you know just having people on your phone, you know, even if you have enough where you're like, okay, I think this makes sense, where I think we can actually do self storage. Even if you don't know the physical numbers and you couldn't figure it out on your own, probably going to pick up the phone, found somebody that was doing it, partnered with them, brought them the deal, and got it done, which is better than not getting it done. I agree. Fifty percent of something is better than zero percent. You know, hundred percent of nothing. But that, 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 that. Awesome. Um, I think that's an amazing place to wrap it up. Yeah. No, I think uh, we're definitely going to have a round two. Yes. Yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, anytime. I'm going to actually. I'm going to have you guys on mine. I would love to. Yes. Yeah, if, sure. uh, if you guys wouldn't mind. No, no, that'd be fantastic. But no, I agree. Uh, you know, just keeping people, keeping aware of people's timing. But awesome place to end. Definitely got to pick it up because you know Charles is a fantastic resource. Thank you, man. Um, it. Handsome home buyer, uh, which is a branded, uh, definitely branded. A fantastic job at that because people Thanks, ask man. me, I'm like, I know him, but you know, and then, but no. Well, it was funny when when we were sat down <laughs> and he was, and I was like, yeah, we got the second. Guy. He's like, is that handsome home buyer? I was like, how the fuck do you know that name? <laughs> He's like, well, he's actually kind of well known in the area. And I had no idea because I just reached out. I was like, oh, this guy's doing some cool stuff in Long Island because yeah. I much prefer having people. And then we do a lot of them over like Zoom calls and stuff. And yeah. it's not just the audio. It's just a better feeling and a vibe. Exactly. And I prefer it. So I was like, oh, let me just see what he's doing. And he was like, oh, okay. I guess I. That's what I saw. I saw that thick calendar like pump up in my inbox. I'm like, wow, that's fucking awesome. Yeah, man. I was like, it's great <laughs> to be here. It's good to connect with you guys. I definitely want to have you on mine. And uh, let's keep it going. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. My pleasure.